So first, I would like to welcome you all again to this fifth conference, the National Conference on the Inklings. So today we're lucky to have here with us uh, Guillermo Espirito, Dr. Guillermo Espirito. Uh, he's a well-known person to us. He has participated in this Congress before, and we have also met in other international conferences. So um, Guillermo is a conventional Franciscan friar who works and lives in Assisi, but he was born in Buenos Aires. And he got his PhD in theology with a specialization in spirituality in Rome. So he's also a professor at the Theological Institute of Assisi, and he has given several lectures on talking in Italy, England, Germany, France, Canada, and Spain. And he has several essays, papers, and books published uh, about talking uh, on different publishing houses like Walking Tree Publishers and He the Shore magazine. So uh, today he's going to be talking to us about uh, liminal beings, uh, more specifically angel-like beings that have been traditionally portrayed in, in literary history. And he's going to be focusing and talking about uh, three specific authors from the Inklings, which are uh, Charles uh, Williams, uh, Tolkien, and C.S. Lewis. So since I don't know much more about this topic, uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you to Aitor who explained why I'm dressed in a strange way. You know, because uh, now and again it happens, especially in, in Germany, uh, that people would ask me, what are you? Uh, and I'm not enough Gandalf-like just to... to the, it's elfish grey, that's okay, but I'm just a Franciscan, but uh, exotic enough with, with that. As the, the topic of the conference is from past to future in the, in the Inklings, um, speaking with, the, with Martin, I, I proposed a, a sort of an overview of the reshaping of medieval angels in, in the works of C.S. Lewis, Charles Williams, and Tolkien. These um, liminal beings, as Aitor was saying, are present in every culture and, and traditions. And uh, from medieval times, they are everywhere, and they permeate art, literature, architecture, philosophy, legends, stories, places, Polychrome and powerful creatures with the wings bloom across the walls and vaults of churches and manuscript illumination and stained glasses, also in England. And all this richness of a and sort of a imaginary liminal world and creatures arrive also to the, the group of the Inklings in Oxford through the uh, Oxford movement. So, C.S. Lewis, we start with him. He wrote an essay on uh, medieval and Renaissance literature called The Discarded Image. It's a scholarly work on literature. And there, he starts uh, telling the importance of the figure of angels in medieval times from a work of an author of the 6th century called the Pseudo Dionysius, the Areop Areopagite. The Celestial Gerarchies was a work, it was believed that he was the man who listened to St. Paul preaching in the Areopago of Athens, but he's an author from the 6th century. And his work was extremely influential in all the medieval times until uh, recent commentaries published a couple of years ago. Then, principally in his, um, in, in, in other works, in his uh, literary creation, Lewis uh, speaks about about um, angels, and he insists in discovering um, 
a description of these mysterious beings of making of light. And we will see some quotes of his, of his works in this sense. And of course, the perception that this author has about angels has nothing of, is a quote from Lewis, a waterishly feminine angels of 19th century art. Tolkien will say it even worse. Uh, we are not speaking of plumpy ladies with swarm wings. Señoras regordetas con alas de cisne. No. Uh, so the, the medieval imagination of angels are mysterious beings, but extremely, extremely powerful and somehow frightening. So, in the Ransom Trilogy, we need to say what is this. Um, Tolkien and Lewis were not uh, happy with the um, things that they were reading. And finally, Lewis said to Tolkien, if we won't write the kind of books we want to read, if they, the others, will not write the kind of books we want to read, we shall have to read them ourselves. And they agree to write, each of them, an excursionary thriller discovered in myth. One about space tra travel and the other about travel in time. And the toss of a coin gave time to Tolkien and space to Lewis. So uh, the, cre the sub-creation in Tolkien will be traveling in time to, in, to the past, for example, the Silmarillion or the Lord of the Rings. And for, for Lewis, this ransom trilogy, three books, three novels, Out of the Silent Planet, Perelandra, and that hideous strength. And the protagonist is Elwin Ransom, who is a man who is somehow kidnapped and brought uh, in a spatial travel. And well, the first novel is situated, we discovered later, that is Mars. And the second novel is in Venus or Perelandra. Uh, so, it's situated in the 20th century, but traveling in space. And this man, who is a philologist, as uh, Lewis himself, discovered uh, a lot of strange beings in his travels. In this space, uh, trilogy, and he called them Eldila, the, what will be a very similar things to the, to the angels. He finds a lot of strange creatures in, his, in these planets, and some of them talked to him and said, the Eldila are hard to see. They are not like us. Light goes through them. You must be looking in the right place and in the right time and that is not likely to come about unless the Eldil wishes to be seen. If you have not read the novels, I will not tell the plot, because they are very interesting and will be very bad to spoil the plot. Anyhow, these mysterious um, worlds are ruled by a invisible one who is called a uh, Oyarsa, which is a kind of um, invisible intelligence who is ruling the planet, one in Mars, another in, in Venus. And he has a lot of uh, helpers, which are this Eldila, which are make of light. And in a certain moment, during the plot, this uh, ransom is brought to the middle of an island to meet this Oyarsa, the ruler of that planet. 
and all other living creatures in that planet are gathered there. And even he saw, or he thought to thaw, uh, whispers of light. And he thinks that there are hundreds of Eldila gathering together around. He never could say what it was like. The merest whisper of light, no, less than that, the smallest diminution of shadow was traveling along the uneven surface of the ground weed. Or rather, some difference in the look of the ground, too slight to be named in the language of the five senses, moved slowly towards him, like a silence spreading over a room full of people. A silence spreading over a room full of people. And there is a typical expression that was used by our grandmothers when in a gathering of people there is a sudden silence. They used to say, Paso un angel. No? Uh, it alludes to that. No? The perception that through silence, someone is manifesting delicately. Ransom felt a tingling in his blood and a prinkling on his fingers as if lightning were near him and his heart and body seemed to him to be made of water. So these invisible or barely visible creatures are so powerful that he's melting away. Oyarsa spoke, a more unhuman voice that Ransom had yet heard, sweet and seemingly remote, an unshaking voice with no blood in it. Light is instead of blood for them. The words were not alarming. What are you so afraid of? Ransom, of you, Oyarsa, because you are unlike me and I cannot see you. So there starts a, a long conversation with this ruler of the planet. And that was an old uh, ancient theory that all the cosmos and all the planets were ruled by invisible intelligence. And uh, he explained him that that is how the works, that how the world works, even in Earth. Tulkalandra is called in the novel. But he said, Ramsom said, but in Tulkalandra we have not Eldila, we have not Oyarsa, no, we have not angels. And the Oyarsa explained to him, you had one. But he became bent, no? doblado, plegado. He corrupted himself. So yours is a silent planet. You are unable to listen the whispers of the Eldila because you are under the rule of the bent one. But if there is another project for your planet, we don't know. It's a thing we desire to look into. And this expression is repeated twice, and it's a quote from the first letter of Peter in the New Testament, when he said that the angels want to look into the mystery of salvation of men. So that was the meeting with these beings of flight. Then Ransom comes back and meets Lewis. Lewis put himself as one of the, of the characters in the book a bit more clumsy than the real Lewis. And hearing all these tales, um, he starts wondering, Lewis saying, but Ransom, that means that if you met the ruler of Mars, is what the old heathen people will call Mars, the, the, the old god. And in Perelandra, you, you met Aphrodite, you met Venus. No? So because the, the tendency to, to see the, 
the old mythologies blend together. You know, the old gods of Greek mythology were considered as sort of angels in medieval times. And in the novels, they are blend together. And Lewis is afraid because Ransom now he's on earth, but there are Eldila in his house. And he's afraid of meeting one. And I don't want that because I might get drawn in in a story bigger than myself. And I don't like that. And Ransom tells him, oh yes, they will put all sorts of things into your head if you let them. The best plan is to take no notice and keep straight on. Don't try to answer them. But Lewis is not reassured. And finally, he is presented to the Eldila who are coming to bring back Ransom to another trip. We went into the next room and I was made to stand before the featureless flame. And there, with Ransom as our interpreter, I was in some fashion presented and with my own tongue sworn in to the great business. The Eldil was with us on the little lawn, hardly visible to my eyes at all in the daylight. And finally, the, at the end of the novel, the Eldila brought Ransom back to earth. And this last note is that we have, it is now time to go, said the tingling voice of an Eldil. Ransom found no words to say. So in Lewis, we have this um, powerful um, overlapping of mythical tales and sort of personal experience, because putting himself as a character of the own novel, he wants to show that somehow it's an uh, experience available to humans to make this kind of, uh, of experience. And uh, that is even more evident in one of the best books by Lewis, the screw tape letters, in, here are translated as Cartas de un Diablo a su Sobrino. If you have not read that, you have lost half of your life. It's the best treatise on uh, temptation that it was ever written, because uh, 30 letters from an unexperienced devil reporting how he's doing with his client to a higher in rank uh, devil who rebukes him for not being efficient enough. No? So it's uh, all upside down the way in which we function. No? Uh, and at the end, these letters were written at the time of the bombing of London during the Second World War. The client died during one bombing. And um, the last report from the poor little devil is that the client escape, no? because he's beyond his grasp. And the rage from the older devil explaining what happened after the client was, was dying. No? The degradation of it, that this thing of earth and slim could stand upright and converse with spirits before whom you, a spirit, can only cower. You had hope that seeing them around him, it would dash his joy. But that is the cursed thing. The gods are strange to mortal eyes, and yet they are not strange. He had not the faintest conception till that the very hour of how they would look, and even doubted their existence, the angels. Eh? But when he saw them, he knew that he had always known them and realized what part each of them had played at many an hour in his life when he had supposed himself alone, so that now he could say to them one by one, not who are you, but so it was you all the time. 
and all that they were and said at this meeting walk memories. The dim consciousness of friends about him, which has haunted his solitude from infancy, was now at last explained. That central music in every pure experience which had always just evaded memory was now at last recovered. Recognition made him free of their company. Only you were left outside. The success of this screw tape levels was enormous. So someone suggests you is to write a sequel, but from the other point of view, the counseling from an archangel to a guardian angel uh, to help a client. And he refused. He said, um, that will be nice, but the standards were too high. Med advice would be no good. Every sentence would have to smell of heaven, and I have no experience of heaven. I have experience of temptations. No? So it's easier to speak about devils than about angels, of course. No? So for Lewis, the, the old traditions of times of old, every mythology has a big amount of truth. In all this reshaping, he introduced that in his creative work, and in his daily life. The, the name Eldila not, was not original from Lewis. He took it from another of the Inglings, Charles Williams, where in, in one of his works, The Place of the Lion, uh, explains the works of the Pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite, and the Celestial Jerarchics using the expression of the Eidola, no? the different kind of, of angels. So this kind of descending order from seraphim, cherubim, until down, down, down to, to men uh, is quite interesting because it's like a cascade of light from the unbearable light of the divinity until our little minds. So in the... In, in this view, humankind, we poor humans, we are in the bottom of the ladder down to earth. And we have the, lev the less level of light. We believe ourselves to be at the top of creation. No? And in this sense, we are at the bottom. No? And we receive light from above in a cascade who pass from one order to the other until our... Uh, are reached to each of us. So that was the, the world in which the Inklings lived, and also Tolkien. And in the case of Tolkien, this has two, how to say, two, two directions. In his sub-created world, we see a complex myriad of mythological and medieval influence and original concepts coming together. Uh, if uh, I hope that you have read the Silmarillion, uh, if you have not, he has, so he has a little hope of salvation, but if you don't, you haven't. In the Silmarillion, we have the Ainuli Landele and the Valaquenta, you know, the account of the creation and the fall of creation. And we see the shaping of the, um, of the universe as a choir of, of the Valar sing a theme of music that Iluvatar uh, give to them, and so they shape the world as we know them. No? That is a very medieval thing, the demiurgic uh, contribution of the angelic hierarchy of the shaping and governance of the universe. And um, one of them, the most brilliant, uh, Melkor, become a bent one, and event, uh, becomes Morgoth. And all the trouble in the created world comes from this bent one. No? And all the, wo the wars of the Valar, and the trouble for the other children of Ilúvatar. 
among this valor, which Tolkien says, says explicitly that are gods, not with capital letters, or angelic beings, there is uh, several of them who take care of creation. One of them is Ulmo, the Lord of Waters, who has an uh, important um, role in the fall of Gondolin, but that we will be seeing this evening, because he is the, the angel of the waters who is very tender for the children of uh, for elves and men, and he will appears to Tuor, suggesting him and giving him messages, which is one of the functions that the Eldila has, according to Lewis as well, and is very consistent in the, in the works of Tolkien, this desire of the invisible one to give good counsel and to suggest things without forcing men or elves. Some of the Valar well, one of the Valar become bent, which is Morgoth, and some of the assistants of the Valar, the Mayar, followed him. So we have Mayar and Valar, the light ones, and the dark ones, in a very um, conflicting way. Among the Mayar, there is a group that we know a bit more because they came to Middle Earth in the shape of man. And these are the wizards, or the Istari, in Unfinished Tales, in the Silmarillion. We know that these wizards, and we know the name of three of them, Saruman, Gandalf, and Radagast, they were Mayar, angelic beings, who took bodies as of old men, but subject not to fears and pains and weariness of earth, though they grew old. They are from a lesser rank than the rulers of the, of the West, but they're helpers. And they volunteer to come to help the children of Ilúvatar in the fight against the followers of Melkor, especially Sauron. Some of the twisted Maiar are the Balrog, the demons of fire. You remember Gandalf facing a Balrog in the bridge of Hasad-dûm. So, uh, how to say, two angelic powers fighting one another. Olorin was the old name of Gandalf still in the West. And he loved the elves and walked among them unseen or in form as one of them, and they did not know whence came the fair visions of the promptings of wisdom that he put into their hearts. In later days, he was the friend of all the children of Ilúvatar and took pity on their sorrows. And those who listened to him awoke from despair and put away the imaginations of darkness. That was the special charism of Gandalf, to awoke from despair and put hope in those who listened to him. So when we remember Bilbo asking Gandalf, you, have, you will have an eye on Frodo, the two eyes if I can spare them, no? is exactly asking Gandalf to fulfill the mission for which and Gandalf came to Middle-earth, to help the others to become themselves and, and to be truly themselves. So, um, as Tolkien says in one of his letters, I believe that legends and myths are largely made of truth. So, um, he has no problem at all of blending all the sources together and in his sub-creation presented us as so attractive figures as Gandalf is, for instance. Gandalf the wizard, in one of the letters he says, strictly he's an angelos in Greek, no? a messenger from the laws of the West. 
sent for train, advice, instruct, arouse the hearts and minds of those threatened by Sauron to a resistance with their own strength and not just to do their job for them. The same as Ulmo, but in a lesser degree. Very seldom in the Lord of the Rings we see an explicit asking for help. You remember the elf crying for Elbereth, no? the queen of the stars, because this angelic being can take a shape of male or female, so there is inclusive language just for those who are sensitive to the topic. Uh, and Elbereth is the most loved of the Valar among of the children of Ilúvatar. But there is another case in which the Valar ask for help to intervene. In Ithilien, when Faramir uh, found Frodo and Sam, and there was an um, ambush to the servants of, of Sauron no? in the woods of Ithilien, and then arrives the Mumak, no? the, the big elephant. And uh, one of the companions of Faramir start crying, Damrod, where, where, cried Damrod, may the Valar turn him aside, Mumak, Mumak, is the only expression in which explicitly a Numenorian is asking for the Valar to intervene. So they still believe that the laws of the Wets can take care of the, of the problems of Middle-earth. And he, this comes from very old times, this love of Tolkien for, of angels, because the first time he found the expression is in, uh, in the tale of Erendil. My pronunciation of um, old English is inexistent, but Eala Erendel Engla Beorthast is Hail Erendel brightest of angels. That is the old expression. Then Erendel becomes another thing, no, in, in Middle Earth. And coming to, to a close, all this sub-creative stuff was evident as well as with C.S. Lewis, in which his um, sub-created stuff is blended together with his primary world life. Also in Tolkien's life is something very similar. During the Second World War, he wrote a couple of letters to Christopher. Uh, he was terribly afraid for the safety of his son, who was a pilot in the um, Royal Air Force in South Africa. And suggests him to remember his guardian angel, remembering an old medieval prayer from the 11th century in England, who uh, sounds like this in Latin, Angele Dei, qui custos es mei, metibi comissum pietate superna, illumina custodi reget guberna, amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom his love commits me here, ever be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. That was very strong in Birmingham, in the oratory where Tolkien study. So this perception of an invisible helper who is beside the human person belongs to the education both of Lewis and, and Tolkien. And in times of need, Tolkien pass over this to his uh, son uh, Christopher. Not a plump lady with swan wings, clear enough, but a sort of a, a personalized providence who takes care of men. The same words that are described in Gandalf in the defense of Minas Tirith walking through the walls said, wherever he came, men's hearts would lift again and the winged shadows pass from memory. Those who listen to him awoke from despair and put away the imaginations of darkness. That was the task of these messengers from the West. And that is exactly the task that both Lewis 
and Tolkien discover in their own daily life with these invisible beings. So as he finishes his essay on fairy stories, we can reassume what we said. God is the Lord of angels and of men and of elves. Legend and history have met and fused. We are not alone or abandoned. Our allies are more numerous than our adversaries, though we don't see them. And one day we may enjoy with them the final victory over destruction, despair, and death. That is one of the messages that the experience of the community of friends who were the Inklings in Oxford in years past can perhaps hand over to us to say that everything can become true and we can enjoy everything because despair is not our last call. Thank you. Okay, so now is the turn for questions. Uh, does any of you have any questions? If so, um, my colleague there will give you the microphone. It's possible to ask also in... Uh, Podéis preguntar también en castellano, por favor, eh? Okay, pues en castellano, si quieres, Guillermo. <laughs> bueno, muchas gracias por, por esta presentación. Eh, adecuada y brillante, como siempre. Y quería hacerte una pregunta, bueno, es un poco general, confirmación para, para que me, me expliques. Eh, creo recordar ¿no? que en la época medieval eh, había tres esferas, eh, cuando hacemos referencia al nivel de los ángeles, eh, en, digamos, the upper part, estaban los serafines, querubines, esa cascada de luz que has dicho, hasta llegar a los arcángeles y por último a los ángeles, que son los que tienen realmente el contacto con los humanos. Uh -huh. De ahí que, bueno, que se entienda, ¿no? pues, por ejemplo, el, el rol de Gandalf, eh, Radagas, que sí que están en contacto ¿no? con, con los hombres. Eh, sin embargo, cuando has estado hablando de Pelandra, de, bueno, de las obras de Luis, sí que vemos que su tratamiento angelical no, no es tan no, no, no. Eh, estricto. Él trata a los ángeles ¿no? de una manera común, no, no respeta realmente digamos, esta jerarquía. ¿no? Eh, ¿Puedes explicar un poquito más eso? Muchas gracias. De hecho, la, al menos en, en, en eh, Out of the Silent Planet y en Perelandra, eh, la única distinción de jerarquía que se ve sería entre lo que serían más o menos los tronos, ¿no? los oyarsa, lo, lo, los que rigen una, una parte del cosmos, que sería el equivalente a, a Ulmo para el agua o Manwe para, para el aire. ¿no? Eh, pero claro, ahí pone un ser humano que puede hablar tranquilamente con, con los que gobiernan los mundos. ¿no? Eh, que sería saltar bastante por encima de las jerarquías. Algún precedente en literatura semítica hay, porque hay la presentación de un serafín que vuela a, con una, una brasa para purificar los, los labios del profeta Isaías. ¿no? O sea, digamos así, eh, Lewis se ha tomado la libertad de no seguir a Pseudo Dionisio como si fuera una cosa matemática, ¿no? eh, porque de hecho se sentía libre de poder imaginar que se, que se podría hacer. Eh, parcialmente comprendo también el, el temor literario que él expresa diciendo pero yo no quiero encontrar ninguno de estos porque, porque me, me muero de miedo, ¿no? eh, dado que no tiene ninguna, nada que ver con las figuras de los de los putini eh, renacimentales italianos, ¿no? los, los cupiditos, niñitos, desnuditos con, con las alitas, ¿no? sino que son eh, algo tan fulgurante que, que, que incute temor. Pero es verdad, no, se han sentido libres. Berlin Flieger, comentando sobre Tolkien, dice, por supuesto que también Valar y Mayer no, no siguen exactamente ninguna estructura canónica, no, no es necesario que lo hagan, ¿no? porque son sus creaciones literarias. Eh, a mí me interesaba solamente mostrar cómo, por, por, por eso decía que es un reshaping de las cosas, una renarración de esas intuiciones que los antiguos autores eh, de la antigüedad tardía o del medioevo habían, digamos, 
imaginado y organizado en un cierto modo, como los grandes subcreadores del siglo XX siguen eh, reimaginando y renarrando las cosas de una forma diversa, pero siempre con una intuición de fondo de que están hablando de algo real. ¿no? Por más de que lo cuentan en un modo imaginario, hablan con una eh, seriedad y respeto, como diciendo, pues es una una chance, un riesgo real de que me pase, de que pueda encontrar algo de esto. ¿no? Y, y esta capacidad narrativa a mí me resulta fascinante. Prefiero, sería muy simpático descubrir de que el ángel de la guarda se parece a Gandalf, pero espero que no tenga ese carácter tampoco. Bueno, ¿alguna pregunta más? Si no, tengo yo un par de cuestiones. Fácil. <risa> bueno, la primera es que, bueno, me preguntaba si tú piensas que, bueno, vivimos en la época posmoderna, digamos, ¿no? Que se caracteriza por la fragmentación y casi por la parodia también, ¿no? ¿Crees que hay, existen retratos de estos seres de ángeles, quizás más contemporáneos, que quizás tirando más hacia el, hacia el ángel trágico o el ángel caído en el siglo XXI? Mi memoria no es la, que, la de un uh, wizard. Eh, hay exactamente un libro de hace unos años que se llama El ángel caído, con una, un análisis muy completa desde la generación del 27 eh, a, hasta, digamos, todos los, los grandes escritores, eh, sobre, sobre todo eh, españoles, eh, del, digamos, hasta, hasta finales del siglo pasado, donde eh, se analiza eh, cómo la, la simbología angélica eh, adopta la, el lenguaje de la, de la decadencia, de la fragmentación, de la, de la fragilidad, eh, y por eso eh, se usa mucho la imagen del ángel herido o del ángel caído. Sí. Eh, porque precisamente eh, esta, como digamos, este universo liminal que eh, en, una, en un universo tan fácilmente armónico y estructurado como era el medieval, todo encajaba bien porque todo estaba colocado, en un, mundo, en un mundo tan desintegrado, obviamente, estos pobrecitos están, per, están perdidos. ¿no? Eh, hay un libro recientísimo de un, un Matthew Fox, se llama, es un ex dominico, eh, que es un, un diálogo con un, eh, un físico, y ahora no me acordaré ni siquiera el nombre del libro, pero bueno, eh, es un diálogo hereje sobre los ángeles o algo por el estilo, muy, muy interesante, porque analiza eh, Pseudo Dionisio, eh, Hildegarda de Bingen y Tomás de Aquino, ¿no? la, la visión de los ángeles que tienen estos tres personajes de la de tarde antigüedad y del medioevo, comparado con el lenguaje de la física cuántica. Eh, y para mi sorpresa, va mucho más adelante que los como siempre, los pobrecitos que se ocupan de literatura, que no tienen nada que hacer en la vida, eh, están siempre atrasados, recuerdo los científicos, ¿no? Eh, porque eh, estos hombres, eh, usando la, mm, neutrones y fotones y demás, muestran cómo la, el lenguaje simbólico de los medievales corresponde mucho más de veras a lo que la eh, ciencia postmoderna Um, des, descubierto del universo en términos de luz ¿no? y dice, en el fondo lograban eh, describir la realidad como estamos descubriendo ahora científicamente a poderlo hacer ¿no? eh, en ese sentido posiblemente la, la, la ciencia que de por sí es más objetiva ¿no? podrá um, ser precursora de que los que se ocupan de literatura recojan los pedazos y hagan alguna obra como la obra japonesa esa de reparar la, la cerámica con, con oro, que no me acuerdo cómo se llama la técnica, 
eh, de modo tal que se cicatrice las cosas y se pueda recomponer una cierta, una cierta unidad. Pero es verdad, los ángeles han pasado el mismo de, 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 sí. destino, digamos, de fragmentación de, de la percepción de la realidad que tiene el hombre. Sí, como prácticamente todo al final. No sé si tenemos tiempo para una última pregunta, supongo que sí. Eh, bueno, comentabas... La concede él, así que está bien. <ríe> Soy el moderador, así que... Bueno, eh, hay un momento en el que hablas de la obra de Lewis eh, y hay una frase que, con la que me he quedado que es eh, lo de I don't want to meet the LD lab because I might get drawn to something bigger than myself. Y me preguntaba si veías una relación entre esto y, eh, bueno, cuando Gandalf va a buscar a Bilbo en el Señor de los Anillos y le involucra en esa quest, ¿no? Que en principio le queda grande, pero que luego quizás no le quede tan grande al final. Probablemente no, no creo de que se hayan hablado, eh, por más de que era el tiempo en que eh, lo, los textos venían más o menos leídos en común, eh, no creo que haya una influencia textual, pero que corresponde a una experiencia que en el fondo es cuando, cuando uno se expone a, una, a la irrupción de una presencia que no manejo yo, ¿dónde esto me puede llevar? No lo sé. ¿no? Eh, lo comentábamos ayer a la noche, eh, ¿se acuerdan cuando eh, Bilbo escucha el el canto de los enanos ¿no? en, en Bag End. Eh, y en un determinado momento Bilbo mira a través de la ventana, escuchando el canto, que habla de, de montañas y de dragones, ¿no? mira a través de la ventana, y en ese momento algún campesino enciende, había encendido un fuego en lontananza, y él ve las, las llamas que se alzan en la oscuridad, y piensa de que hay dragones en el, en el monte. ¿no? El corazón de Bilbo comenzó a cambiar en el momento que se confluyeron la, la voz del canto y el que él mueva la mirada hacia afuera. ¿no? El hecho, de la, el, el temor del, del Lewis literario ahí, de que no quiere encontrar un Eldila porque no sabe que si de, me, me llevan a otro planeta, es el, la misma, el mismo temor burgués ¿no? de, de Bilbo. Es, Adventures are very uncomfortable things make you late for dinner. ¿no? Eh, el, el no querer ser molestados en el equilibrio de nuestras pequeñas eh, eh, cosas confortables. ¿no? Eh, y en el fondo creo que este mundo liminal tiene esa función. En un cierto modo lo, lo adomestica ¿no? para para hacerlo más a la medida de, de la persona, pero al mismo tiempo, después te, te agarra de la oreja y, 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 y te lleva te lleva fuera, ¿no? como el, el Diamond de, Sec, de Sócrates. ¿no? Eh, en el fondo, nuestra medida nosotros no la conocemos. Um, no quiero violentar la, el, a los anglicistas, eh, hay un... Um, un pasaje en el, en el Apocalipsis, en el eh, capítulo 21 o 22, versículo 17, donde está, se está describiendo la Jerusalén nueva, la medida, ¿no? Eh, y el texto dice que el ángel está usando la medida en uso para los hombres, los cúbitos. El texto griego dice... Eh, Ton metron anthropo antropo o estin angelo, literalmente es la medida del hombre que es el ángel. Eh, y algunos, eh, Paul Claudel, por ejemplo, y Sergei Bulgakov, siempre en los años en los cuales eh, Luis y Tolkien escribían estas cosas, se preguntaron, ¿cómo es posible que la medida del hombre sea el ángel?, ¿no? Y dicen, precisamente es eso, ¿no? Esa, la última jerarquía de la, de la cadena, la que está más cercana a mí, es de acuerdo a esa medida que mi humanidad está hecha. Es como si fuera el molde. ¿no? Pero yo todavía no lo conozco, porque no lo veo. Entonces, eh, hay un molde que, que está pensado para que mi vida llegue a una plenitud, que tengo que descubrirlo. ¿no? 
Y eso es lo que la aventura literaria produce, ¿no? Te, te lleva fuera de tu mediocridad pequeña y te, te expande. Bueno, los hobbits se expanden de otra manera también, ¿no? Eh, te, te, te expande a, a la medida de acuerdo a la cual ha sido hecho. ¿no? Cuando se dice al final... Eh, se lo dice Gandalf a los cuatro hobbits, pero incluso Saruman se lo dice a Frodo, ¿no? You have grown up, halfling, ¿no? Has crecido. Eh, a Ransom le dicen la misma cosa. You have grown up. Eh, o sea, has alcanzado la medida para la cual has sido pensado, ¿no? Y nosotros estamos la estamos descubriendo todavía, porque no la sabemos. Y la literatura nos ayuda... A, a medirnos con una medida que no es la medida de, de la dispensa de la, del Hobbit Hole. Por eso pienso que, vale, que decididamente vale la pena perder tiempo con la literatura. ¿no? Eh, es siempre una medida más alta y en el fondo hay esta... como dices, by chance, ¿no? Eh, hay un, un designio de benevolencia para que yo encuentre mi medida. ¿no? Y, y descubrirlo es, es una aventura que vale la pena. Vale, perfecto. Pues muchas gracias, Guillermo. Ha sido muy interesante. Así que, bueno, ahora en un momento pasaremos con el siguiente ponente. Gracias.